this was early enough in our marriage that we hadn't yet tired of convincing each other of that which we believe the other should know by now. It's the only place in Paris, writes Roland Barthes, speaking in the voice of Montpensant, where I don't have to see it. It, meaning the Eiffel Tower, where Montpensant used to eat lunch so he could escape having to see it. From the second floor observation deck, we saw more or less what Barth saw, the transformative power of altitude that makes the city into a new kind of nature. So together we saw the city anew, and down the stairs we laughed, and on the ground laughed even more, wife and husband crossing the Seine on the Passerelle de Belly and strolling beneath the clearing sky along the Avenue de New York, approaching the Palais de Tokyo from the south through a massive marble courtyard encircling an expansive central fountain with mellow marble steps and reclining statues, at which point I had a strange experience that separated us totally. It was a phenomenon I'd felt twice before. The first was in 1996 in San Francisco, moving down Market Street with my father there to visit colleges. I remember moving quickly, watching the bricks of the sidewalk pass under my shoes and knowing where I was leading us, but fearing that my father might find it stupid. Feeling this fear as a kind of pain and thinking, no, turn back. It's not here anyway, is it? But when I saw the palm trees, I knew to look left and suddenly all the fear was gone. It didn't matter if it was stupid because we had arrived and I was standing before Justin Herman Plaza, the world famous Embarcadero, birthplace of modern street skating in the early 1990s bursting open before my eyes. It happened again in 2003 in Philadelphia, this time with a handful of like-minded travelers who shared my aim. Center city smaller than any of us expected and the statue surprising all of us at once, love. Every ledge waxed, every planner laid there explicitly for us to stop us just as they tried to stop everyone else. It was itself and we were there. In Paris, my wife carried on a few steps before realizing that I had stopped, struck by the dream logic that had drawn me here without warning. I've written about this before and I surely will again because I know looking over it that I haven't gotten it right, might never get it totally right. If the world obvious is the one we see, then skateboarding works upon that world as a prism works upon white light, separating its parts. Though I had never been to the Palais de Tokyo courtyard, I had seen it more times than I could count. I knew the place by a different name, Le Dome, from years of videos and photographs, history accrued in skate media in my mind, and if I were to pull it out, my phone. The place I knew was disoriented by this one in which we now stood, thrown awry by the anamnesis of an absent world that had formed in some strange geographical region of my mind. So is it dramatic, I ask? Is it even necessarily metaphorical to say that at this moment I was occupying a place that my wife was not? that despite the bonds of proximity and a shiny new and lawfully ordained union, we were, and perhaps always would be, citizens of two different worlds. So there will be asides. There will be cracks and materials that gather into them. This book is drawn from essays, articles, and other miscellany written between 2010 and the middle of 2020. They are arranged more or less chronologically because the iterative process by which I've worked, including my failures, is every bit as important as any conclusions I've reached. Writing, as it turns out, has saved me from writing. Still, there's a question that has been ringing through my head. For whom? The first answer is the truest, and it is me. The performer and dramaturge Matthew Goolish has described being stopped along the road by a distraction. Quote, the distraction grows into a fascination and the fascination becomes a passion. Then at last, the passion becomes your life's work. I set out to write a novel true to skateboarding's character and the path of that struggle led me to wander over that character, wonder over that character over and over again, which led me to wonder over my own character. For whom? The second answer is skateboarders whose diet for much of our history has comprised story upon story that leave little room for questions. The principal medium of this project has been those full length videos through which skateboard companies create brand identities. Recently and again, the skateboarding industry has aimed to attract new skaters, recruiting them to a lifestyle sport that has begun marketing itself as a pro-social activity. I suppose I'd like us to be a little more conscious of these and other mythologies. It has been my working premise that skateboarding, like poetry, is structurally meaningless. 
contained in or implied by the structural meaninglessness is a quality of non-narrativity that renders the signifier skateboarding like the contiguous land parcel that became the United States of America vulnerable. That without meaning is that which can be abused, manipulated and leveraged toward any number of ends. But not only skateboarders, I would hope. There is too much of this time in this world contained within skateboarding for its interest to be unique to those of us who practice it. Skateboarding is among the greatest human developments or discoveries of the last century. The mere fact of its emergence, which is to say nothing of the circuitous path by which it's developed into its current global form, is as significant as any progress in music, language, or the visual arts. It is every bit as relevant to our moment as yoga, tarot, protest, fascism, or cooking. As relevant as any attempt, in fact, to sort through what it means to be a person who would like to live among and with other people. It is a practice of both faith and finite hard reality, and its rightful place is among the humanities. In saying this, I mean that to know skateboarding is to know more completely the rigors, rewards, and negotiations of being human. And I'll stop there. Uh, thank wonderful. you. Absolutely wonderful. Thanks, man. Uh, <clears throat> um, <laughs> so um, that feeling of being somewhere like Le Dome and seeing a spot that we've only seen in magazines and everything that's just uh, relatable as I'll get out when I read it the first time. Mm. especially being in Barcelona and it raining both days I was there but oh, that's the worst uh, not really it was perfect because <laughs> you know who knew what I was capable of there if I had time and dry yeah. <laughs> surfaces but no it was it was meaningful um on a whole nother level it's the same relate to that big mm -hmm. time um I'm just gonna go ahead and go and start with the first question since it's a little more um stout than the others um as a skateboarder I always see it as a dance or martial art you know mm -hmm. um not so much as a sport but it is turning more into a sport like there's a spectrum of course there's like the athletes there's the artists there's the hobbyists the enthusiasts and all that but um what is the ideal progression or the next phase you think just a just a guesstimate not so much as a in the stone or like line in the sand or anything like that but like mm -hmm. what is the premier like or the progression of it you think that's going to be the next thing you know i think yeah i think that's a good question i think it's it's a question that a lot of people are asking right now um for the, for anyone listening who who isn't super familiar the um the the fact of the olympic games this summer was a very big deal for skateboarders um you know the idea was that it would be a very big deal for the skateboard industry as well right that um by by putting skateboarding for the first time on the kind of global stage and that the industry would see a kind of bump, that there would be a lot of new skaters. Um, and a lot of those skaters would, of course, need to go out and buy skateboarding gear. Um, it seems like the kind of early returns on that are not quite as much of a bump as people <laughs> maybe hoped it would be. Um, but, it, you know, it, it's undeniable that, you know, it, there will be new people who come to the sport because of seeing it as an Olympic game, seeing it as an athletic event. Um, and so what I hear Matthew in your question is like a sort of, a sort of, um, query about like, well, is that okay? Like, is it, is it okay? Is it okay if people start skateboarding because they think it's maybe a path toward athletic, um, you know, success or athlete, you know, some sort of sustainable athletic practice. Um, and I would say that like the sort of short answer is like, yeah, that's great. That's fine. I think however people come to it, um, skateboarding is the sort of thing that it really, I don't know that it matters that much how you come to it. What I do think matters is the other part of your question, which is like, look, there are all these different ways to do it, right? You can have a very spiritual approach to skateboarding, or you can be the weirdo artist um, skater, or you can take it like very, very, very seriously and see it as a kind of skill set to perfect and like, you know, mastery toward mastery. Um, and I think a lot of that comes down to kind of how we talk about it. And, you know, back to the sort of question of the Olympics, like if that becomes the dominant sort of story that we tell ourselves about skateboarding, if, if we allow NBC and the International Olympic Committee and um, advertisers and the government that's building training 
you know, facilities all across China. Like if we allow those people to tell us what skateboarding means, um, then it's going to be a problem, right? I mean, then it, then it's going to be, um, a, a situation where maybe a beautiful thing is kind of robbed of some of its beauty and reduced to slot into where these other things are like basketball or track and field or ice hockey or whatever. Um, but I think, you know, I mean, I'm, I am going to get to your question eventually, but I That's think fine. the answer <laughs> is that like, really so the, <laughs> the great thing is that like skateboarding is pretty good at talking about itself. You know, skateboarding is pre- has some pretty um, powerful built in like self governing um, infrastructures. Uh, and some of those are like, you know, there are always going to be other skaters where you're skateboarding and those skaters um, for whatever reason, or maybe because they're older than you, or they've been doing it longer than you, there is this built in kind of education. That's always part of it. Um, and so, you know, even if there is, I guess what I'm saying is this sort of strain of sport and athletics and the IOC telling us what skateboarding is, um, there are a whole lot of other voices telling us that skateboarding actually is all this other stuff, right? It's it's a bunch of dirt bags under a bri- some highway overpass, you know, with a bag of concrete and rebar making a bunch of obstacles. Like that's not going to stop. That's not going to go away. So probably what we're going to see is just more and more variation, more and more kind of different sort of groups who are doing it differently, which frankly, like, that's great. Like skateboarding is huge and is capable of handling and sort of hosting all of these different sort of ways to look at it, I think. I, I agree. Um, I mean, I, we had to go through a bunch of stuff in the 90s and early 2000s about skateboarding changing the way it is and mm. seeing it used in commercials and product placement, cereal boxes with cartoon characters, skateboarding, you know, and TV shows that highlight the, the, the falling and the dangerous aspect of skateboarding and being called out to do certain things like that randomly you know um so my next thing uh just that was wonderful uh (laughs) my next thing about skateboarding is is again more people are getting into skateboarding and using it as a self-expression and a vehicle um i'm seeing a big change at the skate park going into the skate park being who i am now and realizing I don't have to actually talk to anybody when I'm there or I could talk to everybody when I'm there because it's both Mm. inclusive and and seclusive sometimes. Um, But I'm seeing more women and just the diversity of the skate park has definitely made me want to go back more Mm. and talk to these people more and maybe drop the headphones off in the car this time, (laughs) you know, maybe, maybe not just be in my head so much or just, you know, I don't know, just get into that zone easier by not talking, but eventually accepting their company as well as skateboarders. Um, what do you feel about the, the diversity that is just being represented? And then, um, I mean, everyone should be stoked about this. Absolutely. But yeah. I want to know from um, different parts of the world and different parts of the country of skateboarding, if it's any different than what I've seen here in Arkansas, yeah. you know? So, yeah. I, yeah, I mean, I think, I think, you know, all of the numbers show, you know, the industry, the skate industry does these sort of censuses and these analytics, and they do, they do study quite a bit um, about who are the new kind of growing markets, right? I mean, because all of this is driven in skateboarding by um, sales, right? I mean, people are interested in selling things. So there's all sorts of kind of analytic of the data of who is, who is buying, what are, where do we see the shifts in, um, populace and like who the who the consumers are and what you know what they found is that the 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 strongest growth sector to use terms that i would never in my normal life use (laughs) the strongest growth sector in the skateboarding industry is right now um women women and girls um you know the the sort of word that's that's been thrown around is non-traditional skaters you know which assumes that the traditional skater has been male has been young um and, you know, there are some there are some race and ethnicity kind of um, sure. assumptions about that as well. What, what I will say is, you know, I think what I hear from you also, which is that like the best thing in the world for skateboarding is for the most diverse possible people to be engaged with skateboarding. Like that's like full stop. That's that is just a fact that skateboarding becomes more interesting the more different people who are skateboarding. Right. Like there is no 
there is no body of, you know, it's not like the NCAA where it's like, here's the ruling body. It's not like the NFL where here's the league. Um, what skateboarding is, is a group of people who have decided to do this thing and do this thing that is hard on the body that is, you know, requires time that is frankly really difficult, right? Like, you know, skateboarding is, is really difficult. Um, and so there is this sort of, again, I, both self-governing, as I said in my last answer, but also kind of self-selecting, you know, nobody, right. nobody recruits you to be a skateboarder. Nobody dangles a, a, a carrot in front of you and says, Hey, come, come over here and be a skater so yeah. far. Um, and so the people who do it are doing it because they want to do it. And that's it. Like that's, on the kind of basic level, that's the most beautiful thing in the world. And that's the argument for taking off your headphones is that everyone there at that park wants to be there. And that right. could be the, the, the mom and dad who are there to like sort of chaperone their kids um, who sit on the ledge that you want to skate. And you're like, yo, would you please, please not <laughs> sit there? Like, please go to this bench. Um, the, the fact is, is that even, even they are there because they think that this is a worthwhile use of their kids' time or their time as parents. And there's something like, I think, just kind of basically gorgeous about that, that everyone who's there has, been, has come there because they, they want to be there. And that, you know, at the sort of, again, ground floor level, like there aren't a lot of things like that. Like there aren't a lot of you know, I think of, cause I'm, I'm also in this like whole literary community and, you know, you go to a reading um, and I don't know if you've been, you, your equivalent would probably be like, you know, gallery shows and openings, right? Sure. Like, like openings. Yeah, absolutely. Probably you have a sort of complicated relationship with openings, right? Like so they can be great, but also you can go to them and sometimes be like, oh, here we are again at another opening or whatever. <laughs> and maybe not. And I don't want to project onto you, but I know within the literary world, there are all sorts of reasons why people go to readings at a bookstore or readings at a bar and not all of them are based on i personally really want to be there um because there are all these sort of you know social pressures and you want to be a good literary citizen you want to support people and so on all of which are good kind of checklist motivators for human behavior but when it comes to skateboarding anyone who is there is there because they want to be there and the basic thing is is that it's because it's hard it hurts you you. And in order to do it, you have to be willing to suffer a little bit. And so like, you know, you, you find yourself there and you find yourself talking to someone who you might not on a normal day, talk to someone who's 20 years younger than you, someone who is coming from a point, a place in life and socioeconomic conditions that are radically unlike your own. And the fact Absolutely. is, is that at at a certain level, that stuff kind of fades. It doesn't disappear, but it sort of fades a little bit and allows this other thing to come to the front. And that thing is this shared love. Right. And that's, I mean, it's rad. It's rad. It's completely amazing. I just met, I recently met someone in the community here out skating at one of our spots for the first time, you know, internet pals for sure, probably for years yeah. <laughs> or a year or so, but um, meeting them and having to guess if that was that person or not. But as soon as they started skating in the first trick, knew right away who it was you know so it was like oh introduce wow. and like it's like be like oh okay we're we're skating and it was a great day um i know i get that i guess that's uh just more more people to talk to at the skate park um maybe a little less skating is probably best for me but <laughs> then um <laughs> pushing myself down some of those ramps and when i shouldn't be but honestly um more of the people the better at the, seeing the diversity at the skate park has made me want to go back instead of secluding myself off to a different spot or I know no one's going to be there kind of thing and yeah. it gets it gets to that point when you're a skateboarder and uh, you know I'm you know 36 now but becoming the, um do I want to go out there and watch them you know like I'm just like oh, I don't have the energy today but being out there is enough <laughs> yeah and I mean um, and I think what if I may, what, like what that brings up is sort of like the, the other part of what skateboarding is, which is this sort of um, the responsibilities of being someone who's been in it for a long time. Like, you know, again, to kind of speak of the kind of the, the spectrum of experiences that skateboarding brings to you, like there is a way that when I am at the skate park, I'm a kind of like elder states person, right? Uh, and like, yeah. 
I can understand how for some people who have been skating a long time or are really impassioned about getting better and maybe they're right at the height of their sort of physical abilities, they're in their like late teens and early twenties and they're really motivated. Like I can understand where people are coming from when they get angry and like, oh, you're in my way or like, man, oh. I hate how, how there are so many um, novices here today. I just wanna skate. Like I can see where that comes from. Um, but I think one of the things that I'm hearing and what you're saying is that is this other thing that comes into skateboarding, which is this sense of responsibility, right? Like when you're there, you know that like it, you're not just there to skate, that you do have some sort of role in other people's experiences of it. Yeah. And, you know, I've I've found myself in multiple occasions, like being the one to go over and say to the 21 year old kid, like, hey, chill out, like. This is not, this is not that, this is not your training facility. This is not what you think it is. Or to go to the other grumpy old dude and be like, yo, grumpy old dude, it's maybe time for us to like seed some space here. Um, and that's it. You know, that's the other thing is that like these sort of, you know, social responsibilities become part of what skateboarding is as well. Yeah. Skate park etiquette was, was big. I didn't grow up with skate parks um, where I'm from originally. So yeah. it, coming here and having them, pretty close by like two of them close by I was just kind of like you know I gotta go and a lot of times I you know new new people old people they just don't have skate park etiquette when it comes to things so it's yeah. you know just pass it along yeah. wait your turn lead by example kind of thing you know yeah. <laughs> just have that have that like hold up hold up hold up okay now go mm -hmm. you know <laughs> and you're just standing on the roll in watching these kids just kind of cannonball down in the middle of you know six lanes of traffic like cross down traffic kind of thing and you're just like Ooh. <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> yeah um um well i have one more question i guess we should open it up to the others if they have any questions and if not we can still just uh talk skateboarding yeah um great uh in your book you put you put skateboarding under a microscope um has anything changed your thought process since the book coming out um has it been in the same trajectory or is it, you know, a little different because now you're looking at things a little more after you write them down, they're on, yeah. they're on the page, they're in a book, they're on a shelf, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, let me, let me start by saying that like that's sort of putting skateboarding under the, under a microscope. I want to, I want to kind of make clear that the sort of imp the motivation for that uh, was mostly personal right like most of this comes from a place where my my reading kind of like nibbled at a little bit which is that here is a thing that has mattered to me since I was eight years old right and I'm 43 now so we're talking about you know 35 years of buying skateboards riding skateboards watching skateboard media thinking about skateboarding talking to people about skateboarding and you know for the last 10 years that's meant writing about skateboarding which is not something i ever set out really to do um so the sort of like you know the motivation for me was like hey here's an obsession like here is something that is part of my life that i never really um, have, as you said, put under a microscope. And so a lot of it was just this sort of impulse that is the writerly impulse, which is to like interrogate, like, what is this? What exactly even is this thing I've been doing for 35 years now? Um, and I think, you know, to your question about how things have changed since the book came out, like a lot changed along the way in those 10 years right i mean skateboarding itself changed so the target was moving all over the place right it was a big decade for skateboarding as you said there are a whole bunch of new skaters um the sort of the the industry itself really changed shapes um it stopped really in this last decade being an industry that was rooted in southern california or northern california and is now a completely global um phenomenon with kind of you know european industries um it, 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 villages in Uganda building their own DIY parks and kind of homemade boards popping up. Like it is a phenomenon that is no longer a Californian thing. Um, 
so skateboarding was changing. My relationship to it was changing. And so there are a lot of moving pieces. And so what, what you'll see in this book, which I hope you do, whoever you are out there, like I hope whatever your relationship to skateboarding, um, I, I do believe that there, there is quite a bit in this book for the non-skater. I would hope so, because as I say, it is, it is bigger than skateboarding, what we're talking about here. Um, mm -hmm. What you'll see in this book is a lot of sort of confusion and a lot of round trips where I set out in one direction and find myself turning back around and coming back to where I started. Um, it really is a kind of essay in that, in that sort of basic sense. There is a lot of attempting to interrogate something. Um, and, you know, the great thing about the essay form and the great thing about my editor, Wes Miller at Grand Central, um, is that it's a very forgiving kind of place. Uh, and it allows for contradictions um, and confusions um, and you know iterations and attempts and failures and trying and trying and trying again, just like skateboarding does. Um, so what I feel like now that the book exists and I've gotten through all those kind of failures and confrontations and um, now it's all here in this 310 or whatever page book. It's, it's very strange. Like my relationship to skateboarding um, is, is very different. Like I go out now to skateboard and I, um, I'm doing it a lot more loosely. I'm a lot yeah. less um, aware of how what I'm doing is, is maybe somehow fitting into both my art project and also this kind of bigger question about what skateboarding is. Like, Skateboarding will continue to change, right? This is not the last book, I hope to God, that is written about skateboarding. Um, my relationship to it will continue to change. I feel very, very, very grateful to have, the have had the opportunity to contribute something to the culture of skateboarding. Um, and, you know, there, th the way the skateboarding world has received this book has been kind of mixed, like I would hope. You know, there are some people who think like, oh, this is... You're taking this shit, you're taking this stuff way too seriously. And then there are other people who are grateful to have had someone take it way too seriously. Um, what I feel, what I, what I think now when I look around at skateboarding is that it's in a really good place. Like its trajectory is in a really, really good direction. I, I have a lot of faith that it's going to continue to just get more and more interesting. Um, and then, you know, as you heard in my answer, like I feel relief. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to have had this project behind me now and I can now sure. like work on a new trick and I just want to land a new yeah. trick. Um, yeah, yeah. So that's it. It's loose. I feel sure. good. Like sure. I feel, I feel fortunate. I feel really fortunate. Cool. Awesome. Um, I'm glad you feel fortunate. It's a, uh... thank you. Thanks. <laughs> um, one quick personal question. Um, how are the streets in Chicago, how is skating in Chicago? I mean, I, I've yeah. only known of it as, as winter and I'm from South Florida originally. So skating there was, is desolate kind of until, yeah. you know, probably recently. Um, <laughs> But man, Chicago. <laughs> so Chicago, Chicago has a lot of really good downtown spots. Um, you know, yeah. like like all major metropolitan yeah. areas, there's a great downtown area. Chicago also Thanks. has this yeah. giant network of public schools, the, all of which look like they should have a bunch of spots at them, and there are none. Just none. It's it it it, it is it boggles the mind how non. <laughs> non-productive the the school system in chicago is um the other thing about chicago that's really important is that there are no hills so it's a completely flat city it's a completely gritty right right right, right. um so there are no like acute angles there are no weird hills that lead to elevation changes that lead to like gaps or those sorts of things um the suburbs is a little bit of a different question but within chicago you know it's it's an interesting kind of skate city because you would think there would be more spots than they are. Um, that said, you know, we've got a kind of, uh, I would say an un, an underserved park system. Like we don't have great skate parks. We have a few parks. They are slowly building more, but they're far beyond behind the curve on that stuff. Um, you know, I mean, Chicago is a busted city. It's like, it's, it's budget is, is, we are very much running at a deficit. Um, there's not a lot of money in Chicago, Chicago parks to build new parks. Um, they spent oh. a lot of money on a very big park downtown. It's called Grant Park. Um, 
and it's a pretty good park, but as you read in the book, um, it's a park that is enclosed on three sides. And so it creates this bottleneck and police officers come and kind of sit at the entrance to it. And it feels kind of observational. It feels a little bit like a surveillance state. Um, and that's not ideal for skating. It's not, it's not no. the sort of situation <laughs> one wants. Um, so yeah, it's a mixed bag. You know, I mean, what I will say is that when I moved to Chicago in 2003, like I was very intimidated by it. It was a very clicky kind of scene. Um, there was, you know, the shop that's been here forever is called Uprise. And I was very intimidated by those dudes for a long time. Um, that has really, I think, opened up. Like, I think Chicago has changed a whole lot in the last 15 years in terms of different crews um, doing very different things, none of them thinking that they are the one, right? Like, sure. there's a real openness and a sense of community that I really appreciate here these days. Um, and that starts with this core skate shop right in the middle of it called Uprise, which is as good as any shop I've ever stepped foot in. Right on. Um, I think that's what helped me um, transitioning here it, to be a skateboarder in Arkansas yeah. instead of like Florida is that everybody was pretty awesome right off the bat. Yeah. Um, a couple of hecklers at the park, but you know, they, they, <laughs> they get, they, they find out who you are and then you're like, Oh, okay. you know, yeah. you know they, they quiet down, but it's also motivational heckling, which is good, you know, here yeah. and there. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. But yeah, it's uh, definitely awesome that uh, you had Uprise eventually to go to. Um, yeah. See, that's that's something that's missing here after a while. When I first got here, there was a few shops and now there's zero. And, you know, there's some in the mall, but, you know, some of the skaters you just hear like, I won't go there. Yeah. <laughs> and they never, they never thing. give in. It's yeah. a really hard thing. Um, and that's a hard thing also to explain to people who are not sort of native to skateboarding, like what role the skate shop plays. Um, right. You know, it's, it, it is in some key ways a kind of community center, right? I mean, it is a place where a lot of young people will go and feel okay um, walking in at any hour during the day and, and meeting up with other kids who come there and so on. Um, the, the role they play really can't be overstated um no. so are you saying that there's no sort of like skater owned no. shop in little rock um there might be one but i'm not too sure it shares um i don't know the longevity of it it shares how yeah. a roof with a um head shop so yeah uh again i'm not too sure if that hurts or helps a situation yeah. but um you know when when i got here there was pretty decent shop in north little rock and then there was a shop here i guess the both shops were in north little rock i don't think little rock's ever had a decent shop since early 2000s late 90s maybe. Yeah. um so it becomes a thing uh for you know the, the community to have a core shop to go to like you said to mm -hmm. um get something like of a skateboard or a shirt or shoes like you got to know what's new what's coming out yeah. um what's the the new thing you know like or mm -hmm. like meet up and then go to the, the spot or yeah. the skate park and yeah and then you have yeah, they people do. they end up being sort of hubs you know um and i yeah and i you know it's hard it's a hard market it's a very hard you know as as much as we talk about like the independent bookstore and the independent bookstore mm -hmm. as being a, a kind of hub of of community and 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 the necessity mm -hmm. of them um skate shops are every bit the same situation and they face the same sort of uphill battles to be a brick and mortar store in these days is, is, is tough. And so you'll see people trying to find a kind of crossover where skate shop and head shop or skate shop and coffee shop and you know, what have you, I think of um, Louisville, Kentucky has an incredible skate shop called home. Um, and, it's a great name. You know, yeah, it's great. And in the time that I've been going down to Louisville, because, you know, I lived in St. Louis and would drive to Louisville and we drive down from here. Sometimes I have dear friends in Louisville. It's like my taste of the South. It's like, it's like you just dip down yeah. a little and get a little, just yeah. a little smidge of Southern sure. hospitality. <laughs> um, but that shop, you know, I've seen that shop now in three different locations and they keep just kind of being bounced around from some situation or other, but the, the core of it and the, you know, the name of it, the, the identity of it remains the same. And there's, there's something, there's something to that. I think there's something valuable about that. Absolutely. And it's something to strive for in the future here, if not, you know, open a conversation with other skaters. Um, there is private 
parks, I guess, mm-hmm. or ramps. Yeah. <laughs> and that that community is growing here. And um, I was wondering if you had friends with private, you know, TFs or training facilities, you know, like as they would say, mm-hmm. and memberships and stuff like that, because that's kind of growing too to control the longevity of something like that in a weird, unstable scene, you know, yeah. of, of like not consistent weather, changing weather, um, changing politics on yeah. how long you can be at the park, the lights, you know, all that good stuff, you know. You know, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know. You know, I guess I've got some friends who have access to that sort of thing. You know, Chicago's sure. winters are the sort that we, we, there's always something, someone's got some ramp in some old warehouse space where you can find it. Gotcha. But I guess the, the, the thing it makes me think about um, my friends in Phoenix run a, run a organization called uh, skate after school, which is exactly what it is, right? Like it's a, it's, it's a sort of traveling skate after school program that moves from different Phoenix area public school to different, you know, five days a week, they're at five different schools um, Mm. that end up just like bringing some basic ramps along. They have all of these skateboards that people have donated. Um, Every year they do a kind of, I think it's called a skate angel drive where people, they just kind of um, a local shop puts a deal together and people from across the country donate money to provide this skate after school program with boards for um, boards and pads and ramps and so on for kids to use. Um, and it's, it's amazing to me, like what, what that does in terms of popular perception of what skateboarding is, right. It's like, it's very hard, I think for a, an unenthusiastic parent or older person or mayor or, you know, whomever the person is in a community to see some of these promotional materials that they put out, which are like, here are children learning adversity, moving their body, dealing with failure, acquiring new skills, enjoying themselves in ways that they maybe don't otherwise. Like, look at what's happening here with these kind of programs. Um, It's very hard, I think, for people to see that and not see it as a pretty unvarnished necessary good. Um, And so it seems to me that maybe one of the things that a city, and I don't know about Little Rock because I've never been, um, and I don't want to, you know, diagnose from a distance, but it does seem <laughs> to me that that's the sort of thing that that can change a lot of minds, you know, that the sort of scrappy upstart nonprofit um, organization that works on introducing skaters at introducing skateboarding as a sort of alternative to whatever, right? Like. What? it's powerful man. it's a powerful <laughs> force i it, you know you know and i start talking totally about this powerful. stuff and i start like hearing myself and i start becoming like this evangelist and i start <laughs> like recruiting folks to the skate but, but you know the fact is is there's something there there's there's something in the lessons that skateboarding teaches that you don't get exactly from sport it's different than school um it's social in a way that you know one hopes that um youth groups and other organizations are social and it it and it it does it it it, it's good. It's a good thing. Yeah. I mean, it's almost a perfect storm of, um, you know, someone being social or learning how to be social in a crowd or learning how to speak up or, you know, yeah. oh, you know, picking themselves up and, and visualizing their um, motivation to keep going. And it's yeah. there playing out in front of them, you know, and like that kid can back 180, but mm, I can't yet, you know, yeah. he's yeah. going to keep trying just even if it's healthy one up and ship, it's still, yeah. It's still there to as the power as a motivator to get up and and maybe, you know, get through that day of work to get to that skateboard, you know, or you know, as a reward to myself, I use it. And that's that's how it is now. Yeah. Um, I don't get to do it as as often as I want to and daydream about it, but when I do, it's great. I'm grateful for it, and I'm yeah. grateful to have the um, infrastructure here. Yeah, you know, like you know, and that's so. it. I mean, ultimately, like. And I'm uh, apologies to any Q and A's that we're skipping here, but like ultimately, oh, that's no. that's sort of the thing that you know this book ends up coming down to is just like this feeling of just just profound gratitude, just mm-hmm. absolute gratitude for first of all this activity which is strange and didn't exist until the 1960s, right? It's a young right. thing. Um, to all the people I've met through it, to all the lessons I've learned about myself, to all the ways that it's helped me understand marriage and writing and adulthood and aging. And, you know, I'm for my body is falling apart, but I understand that 
in a particular way because I'm using it in this particular way. So, you know, the thing is that I feel more than anything is just this just powerful sense of gratitude. Like, thank, thank you to this thing. Yeah. Um, and I don't know, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know how many things we have, how many occasions we have to just outright feel grateful um, on a given day. And, you know, I think that, that, that alone is a, is a pretty strong argument for, yeah. for it. I, I didn't have any questions in the Q and a, um, well, then we're good. Yeah. Um, so I'm just going to keep, uh, uh, talking about the really quick. I want to give a shout out to, um, all the DIYers out there in skateboarding, <laughs> um, man, they're making it work. Uh, and again, I, I, I feel grateful to see, uh, where, a a flat pad of concrete can be thrown some bags on there. And, um, Oh, I think I have a question real quick. Um, sorry about that. Let's go ahead. Um, and it's just a, well, like a flat pad of concrete with some quick creep and maybe a wheelbarrow and some shovels. They have built a park that just kept growing. And I'm talking about Canis Park here. And you can look it up and it's pretty great. Uh, there's someone of the city put a bowl in in 1986. Mm. Um, and it's sitting in this park and it's still there and it probably has about uh, thousands layers of spray paint and, you know, latex paint or whatever they did to clean it up for the Canis bash every year and, um, still sitting there, but they built a beautiful situation and I watched it grow. And then all of a sudden, you know, Coca-Cola comes in and spends $130,000 to build a newer part next to it. Um, and I just, just marveled at it, you know, because I watched it grow from like this little thing into like this larger thing. And now everybody gets to this park. So um, anyway, I just want to just be like, if, if you, you talk about St. Louis and that DIY, which I got to go to the Kings highway one. Um, I definitely got to go to once mm -hmm. or twice. Mm -hmm. And it was amazing, especially the polished side at the very end, they were getting to that bowl or almost burn side polish, you know, it was very yeah. smooth and wonderful yeah. towards the end there. But I was just, you know, mystified by that. Um, the question is how, uh, we got one question here. Um, it says, how has the pandemic impacted skateboarding? Well, that's a big one. Um, yeah. Let me, let me follow up real quickly on the DIY thing. Just that sure. like, you know, I think one of, one of the sort of basic appreciations that I, I would love more people to have about skateboarding is the way that they, um, the way that skateboarding essentially makes use of otherwise completely dead and useless parts of a city, right? Like what skaters always do when they're not in parks is move through the city and activate it, right? I mean, this is like a big, a big term in urban planning is activating space. Um, and, and that's essentially what skateboarders do. And what we're discussing here with this DIY stuff is like dead lots, lots, you know, a city like Little Rock, I know a city like St. Louis, a city like Chicago is just riddled with unused parcels of land. And what skateboarders have proved themselves to be very good at is activating those parcels and making them into something. Um, all right, now, as far as the pandemic goes, uh, <laughs> you know, my pandemic, my pandemic, my, my experience with the year 2020 and into 2021 now has been, you know, a lot of the time I was writing a book um, in terms of skateboarding, you know, what it led to was A, a whole lot of people skating alone near their house be a whole lot of new skaters, um, people because they were kind of um, quarantined and stuck in the house deciding like, boy, I, I might as well get back into skateboarding. This thing I quit 10 years ago, what if I try it again? Um, so there was a big run on skateboarding goods, right? Like the pandemic um, was very, very good for the skateboard industry, except for C or three, which is that there was this global shortage, right? I mean, like supply chains were totally, um, futzed up and that led to all sorts of, um, delays and, and challenges on skate gear. So you saw a whole lot of sales in the industry, and then you saw a whole lot of challenges getting the sort of things that people want. Um, 
I think for a lot of skaters, it was, I mean, you know, the, the, the sort of silver lining of that was that a lot of American cities were underpopulated for the first time, right? You know, a day, daytime office workers weren't there. Daytime office building security was not there. And so there was a lot security of, guards weren't there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There was a lot yeah. of, a lot of skateboarding in places where, you know, otherwise it would have been just like strictly, verboten um so that was that was important um you know what what remains to be seen is what happens to all those skateboards that were bought like do they just get like leaned now in in a in a garage spot and people go about their lives i mean we've seen a lot about pandemic puppies and people deciding to return their puppies which is heartbreaking um but you know i think there are a lot of things that people did during the pandemic because they were in different circumstances that now they're finding like oh what do i do with this um and so you know probably it's going to lead to a lot of used skateboards in the world yeah so well i think we're at the 10 minute mark on here oh we got another one i do believe um what advice do you both have for the early 20s college student wanting to get better at skating my own town doesn't really have a huge skate scene, nor does it have any parks. So it isn't the easiest to meet up with people and learn the experience, you know, mm, that hits home. <laughs> yeah, that's tough. Um, yeah. You know, you, you said it earlier, Matthew, like I grew up without, par- I didn't have any parks, right? I mean, I had a neighbor up the street and we kind of started skating and then I sort of found my way into a friend group in grade school and then into junior high. And before I knew it, I had this really great core of friends in high school that we all shared this thing. It's very hard if you don't, if you don't have a a group around you to engage in this activity with, right? Like, you know, doing it by yourself is it's very different now, of course, because there are YouTube videos, there are tutorials, there's a lot of guidance for the new skater for figuring out how to go about doing the thing. Um, But, you know, if you're not, if you're not part of a crew, if you're not part of a world where people are doing it, it can be really, really, really challenging to to find the motivation to keep doing it. Um, I mean, you know, here's the answer. I think, and I don't know. This is this is like adjust your your corny radar in, in a minute here, but like. If you, if you get into it and you find that you love it, you're going to pursue it, right? Like give yourself enough time to see if this is something you're really interested in. And if you are really interested in it, you're going to make it work. And that could be road trips. That could be networking online and finding folks nearby. Um, That could be, you know, really, you know, getting dirty and being alone in the driveway and working on your kickflip, working on your nollie flip and like just getting it there to hope that someday soon you will get out and travel. And that's, that's the ultimate answer is like, if you don't have a thing in your hometown, like get on the road and go find skaters. Cause there are so many out there um, and they're welcoming people. They tend to be. Yes, they are. Um, my suggestion is to look up Willie Santos trick tips from trans world. It's <laughs> It's 15 minutes, I guess, of maybe even less than that of how to do these things and go out and learn as much as you can, as as much as you can. Um, just find those people. Uh, they will be they will be out there. Don't be afraid to meet new people and don't don't you know write anybody off. And I think you'll find that you'll there's more around you than you think. Um, yeah. Especially, I had a parking lot with a curb, and I still have a parking lot with a curb. So <laughs> it's, it. it's always going to be there for you and you're always going to find where, where to skate. Um, I mean, even Rodney Mullen can skate on a little, you know, three by three pad and be happy, yeah. you know? Yeah. So um, I found myself in the same situation sometimes. So it's just about, again, the motivation of getting out there yourself and yeah. just, if you love it, you will keep going. <laughs> yeah. Well put. Very well put, Matthew. Well, thank you. Um, I think we're going to go ahead and um, I want to, you know, say thank you so much. We're going to be, we're really close to the end here and I don't want to get over it since I'm a freshman doing this. <laughs> no, yeah. Don't, yeah. Don't burn past the ending. Um, um, one thing I do want to say, because sure. you, you asked me to come up with uh, one other uh, or some of the other events at 
the book festival I'm in, excited for. I will absolutely sure. be seeing Margaret Rankel, um, who wrote a yeah. book that I think is one of the most beautiful books written in the last 10 years called Late Migrations. Um, and she yeah. seems to be speaking on October 31st, Halloween day at 1 p.m. Um, and yeah. I will definitely be there to hear her speak of her new book, which is Great. called Grace, Graceland at Last. So exactly. thank thanks you. for using cows, man. Thank you. Yeah, That's man. Awesome. Well, thank you, Matthew, for the conversation. And thank you, of course, to the book festival organizer. I, yeah. It's Absolutely. I've, I've enjoyed the book and I enjoyed talking to you both times. So thank you so much. Oh yeah. <laughs>